If I'm being honest, this is the moment where everything changed for me when it comes to Blue Origin. The moment when a company actually has a successful flight, and in this case, a very successful flight, that earns them a generous measure of respect from the angry astronaut, especially if it was the first flight. Yes, it took Blue Origin forever to get to this point, years and years later than they were expecting. Expecting, and yet they still insisted on being treated like any other company that had already reached orbit and were willing to file multiple lawsuits to enforce their claim. I never respected that, and I still don't, but when it comes right down to it, Blue Origin has finally reached the point where other companies need to be respectful of their accomplishments, and they deserve some contracts at this point, and they have definitely earned some even from the U.S. military. But all of that having been said, one flight of their flagship rocket is definitely not enough. Certainly they're not going to accomplish the same things that SpaceX is going to be accomplishing in the next few years, especially if we're talking about Artemis missions. Obviously, SpaceX has a big lead with Starship and we can expect Lunar Starship to be landing on the lunar surface well before Blue Moon does. Well, hold on for a minute, because it seems that Blue Origin has other plans. Indeed, if everything goes the way Jeff Bezos plans, the first Blue Moon mission will take place this year, well before Lunar Starship comes anywhere close to cis-lunar space. Good morning and welcome to another Angry Bulletin from Manhattan, New York, and uh, really looking forward to the flight that I'm about to take that's going to take me back to London, back to the UK, the place where at least most of the time I like to call home, although really I end up traveling all over the world, it's tough for me to determine exactly where I live on a permanent basis, but still plan to be in the UK for several months at least. In the meantime, we need to talk about Blue Origin, a topic that usually goes hand in hand with harsh criticism on this channel. I've been rather vicious and ruthless when it comes to criticizing Jeff Bezos and his step-by-step -step ferociously policy, which has generally meant step-by-step -step and doing nothing. However, that's changed lately. My philosophy always is show me something impressive and my opinion about you folks might change. And that applied to SLS. I was just non-stop criticizing SLS until I actually managed to toss the Orion spacecraft into lunar orbit, came back without any sort of significant issue. Sure, maybe a couple things with the heat shield, but overall, it was close to flawless on the first flight. It's impressive and certainly deserves at least some respect, and that is the case with New Glenn as well. In spite of the enormous time that elapsed before this rocket finally took flight, didn't just reach orbit, actually reached a pretty aggressive orbit with a very high perigee and apogee, and again, I think quite impressive for a rocket's first flight. Sure, the booster didn't land on the first try, but that was to be expected. I would have liked Blue Origin to have shown us more details to actually show the booster plunging into the ocean or attempting to land something along those lines, but unfortunately, up to this point, we haven't seen much of anything from that. But one announcement we have gotten, which is very, very impressive from my perspective, is the notion that Blue Origin may be setting the unmanned version of their Blue Moon Lander on the lunar surface before the end of the year. That is their stated objective. Not only that, they've also rolled out the details for their Earth to Moon transport. That is to say, a refueling tug, essentially, that 
that carries fuel to lunar orbit rather than doing the refueling in Earth orbit. And this, of course, being an absolutely crucial part of their whole HLS design, the ability to refuel in lunar orbit before setting down on the moon. Any reusable lunar lander is going to have to have that refueling capability. So what does all of this mean? Is Blue Origin really going to set down on the moon this year? And if so, does that mean they may have a human-rated spacecraft ready for a lunar mission before SpaceX does? In the course of this video, I'm going to be quoting extensively from two articles, one from AviationWeek.com and the other from SpaceNews.com. We'll start off with the Aviation Week article. Quote, Blue Origin will attempt to land an uncrewed prototype of its human landing system on the moon's south pole this year, according to John Kaluris, Senior Vice President of Lunar Permanence. And this was a statement made on May 20th, just a few days ago. The company's HLS is one of two in development in partnership with NASA to support crewed landings on the moon under the Artemis program. NASA awarded the first of two HLS flight service contracts to SpaceX, which plans to use a variant of its still-in-development Starship Super Heavy system for NASA's Artemis 3 and 4 missions. Blue Origin's HLS was tapped for Artemis 5. Okay, none of that is new. Let's see what else is going on. Blue Origin's Mark 1, which is slated to launch this year on a shakedown mission to the lunar south pole, is designed to carry nearly 3.9 tons to any location on the moon's surface. By contrast, the small fleet of small robotic landers that NASA is backing under its commercial lunar payload services contract are designed to carry about one ton. Powered by a single liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen fueled BE-7 engine, the Mark 1 will launch aboard a Blue Origin New Glenn rocket and aim to touch down within 33 feet of its intended target, or 10 meters. And this is according to an announcement that Kaluris made at the opening day of the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium Conference at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. Assembly of the BE-7 flight unit is nearly complete and is expected expected to ship out to Johnson Space Center in Houston in about six weeks for thermal vacuum chamber testing. Quote, once that's done, it'll come to Cape Canaveral, get integrated, get encapsulated, and then launch on New Glenn a few months after that, once again, according to Kaluris. In addition to testing technologies and operations for future Mark II vehicles, the Mark I will host some NASA and commercial payloads, including a NASA-awarded experiment to measure BE-7 plume impingement on the lunar surface. Very important to gain an understanding of how much debris and how much regolith a rocket engine is going to kick up on the lunar surface because really big rocket engines could theoretically launch debris into lunar orbit, which could be very hazardous for future missions. Galoris also unveiled an updated design for the HLS system's transporter module. The vehicle is designed to launch separately on a new Glenn and be refueled in low Earth orbit using X as propellant from the rocket's upper stage. The transporter will then travel to lunar orbit and refuel an awaiting Blue Origin lander ahead of a crew's arrival via the Space Launch System and Orion capsule. So refueling being required here both in low Earth orbit and in lunar orbit, but given the fact that the human-rated Blue Moon lander is not nearly as massive as Lunar Starship, I suspect it's going to require a lot less refueling than SpaceX's plans will require. So the transporter is capable of bringing roughly 110 tons from Earth orbit to lunar orbit or up to 33 tons to Mars orbit. And this opens up the solar system, according to Caloris. A ground demonstration of zero boil-off cryogenic propellant storage, which is absolutely necessary if you're going to be refueling things in orbit, is underway in Washington State, where Blue Origin is based. Quote, by June, 
we will be able to be showing that we are consistently holding cryogenic hydrogen oxygen as storable propellant. That's again, according to Coloris, it will be the first time on this scale that we've done this. By June next month, let me tell you something, compared to everything that Blue Origin has done up to this point, that is some very aggressive timing. Now, although the transporter is not necessary for the unmanned version of Blue Moon to set down on the lunar surface, it definitely is for the HLS version. So let's learn a little bit more about it. The company provided few details about the transporter at the time that they won the NASA contract, $3.4 billion by the way. Originally, the transporter was going to be developed by other companies that were part of the Blue Origin-led national team, but industry sources said that Blue Origin has since taken over development entirely, and I think that's a hell of an idea because the companies that they were going to be collaborating with, the old legacy companies would have taken forever to get this job done. Quote, this vehicle has evolved significantly since we first won the contract. This again, according to Coluris, the purpose of the vehicle remains to aggregate liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellant in Earth orbit and then transport it to a near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon where it will transfer the propellants to the blue moon lander to enable it to perform a lunar landing. The transporter will be launched into low Earth orbit on a New Glenn rocket and then fueled using excess propellant from the New Glenn upper stage as we said before, although he did not disclose how many refuelings would be required. It will use tanks 7 meters in diameter, which is the same as the upper stage. Quote, instead of doing bespoke tanks for individual vehicles, it's using the same assembly line. A key enabler for the system is zero boil-off technology to prevent losses of cryogenic propellants. You always hear, wow, that's hard to do, and it is hard to do, he said. But he noted that the company is making progress on that zero boil-off technology that maintains liquid hydrogen at 20 degrees Kelvin, or 20 degrees Celsius, above absolute zero, and liquid oxygen at 90 degrees Kelvin. By the way, something I've noticed about this design, it has a sun shield absolutely essential to keep propellant from boiling off, very similar to what ULA had in mind for a Centaur-based fuel depot. So they're definitely putting thought into this. Working with NASA, Blue Origin has integrated its first prototype and put it in a thermal vacuum chamber. Quote, by June, we'll be showing that we are consistently holding hydrogen and oxygen as storable propellants. And by December, we'll start our flight units. Once again, very aggressive timing. Coloris argued that being able to store liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen for extended periods would be a breakthrough. That propellant combination has the highest performance of major chemical propulsion systems and can be obtained from water on the moon or other celestial bodies. I completely agree with that. Hydrolox is much easier to access through in situ processes, especially on the moon, than methylox is. A fully fueled transport order can carry about 100 metric tons, as I said before, from Earth orbit to lunar orbit with applications beyond the moon as well, including that 30 metric tons to Mars that we talked about. It can open up the asteroid belt, he said. It can open up the solar system. He didn't offer schedules for testing the transporter or the Blue Moon Mark II lander. During a separate panel at the conference on May 20th, Jackie Cortese, Senior Director of Civil Space, said that the company expects to conduct both an uncrewed test landing of the Blue Moon Mark II as well as a crewed landing before the end of the decade. Now, is that fast enough for Blue Origin to put humans on the moon before China does, assuming that space X can't come through with Lunar Starship? Kind of hard to tell, but it looks like that's what they're trying to accomplish. Blue Origin is also building a second Blue Moon Mark I lander about six to eight months behind the first. Quote, we're building intentionally now to get hardware rich, according to Coluris. If the first mission is not successful, we'll learn from it and learn from the objective we succeeded in and the ones where we didn't succeed in and we'll incorporate those into the next vehicle. 
Ortiz said that the work on the Blue Moon is in a dedicated facility. We intend for it to be a production line capability, she said, but she did not discuss the projected production rate for the lander. Quote, it was really important for us to procure all hardware for the two Mark I missions years ago, citing supply chain challenges. Ideally, we'll have a successful first mission of Mark I, incorporate any findings, and be able to fly again, she said. And if it's not successful, we have another lander ready to go. That was something that was really important to us. But here's the big question. Is Blue Origin going to be able to put an HLS on the lunar surface before a SpaceX can? And if so, is that something that NASA would actually entertain, especially if it looks like Lunar Starship is starting to lag behind? So of course, an obvious question remains. If Blue Origin does manage to pull this off, and if they can get their human-rated version of Blue Moon ready before Lunar Starship is ready, are they going to be the ones carrying out Artemis 3? I mean, there's a lot of contractual obligations, a lot of commitments that NASA has made that's going to give SpaceX a pretty strong position, both legally and otherwise, to set down on the moon first. But if Lunar Starship starts running into issues, it's very possible that Artemis 3 isn't going to happen before the end of Trump's final years in office. And if that happens, the only chance that Trump may have to make that historic phone call to astronauts setting down on the moon, something that was a huge distinction for Nixon's administration, something I'm sure Trump would like to have, well, Blue Origin may turn out to be his only alternative. And let me tell you something, regardless of what Elon Musk might have done for Trump in the past, if it's a choice between making that phone call and not making that phone call, I assure you, Trump is going to go for the first option, regardless of whose toes he has to step on. And from my perspective, if it comes to beating the Chinese to the surface of the moon and establishing a permanent presence on the moon before China can manage to do it, I think that stepping on toes may be what's necessary and is entirely justified. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Once again, looking forward to seeing my British viewers again. I'll be there in less than 24 hours. Very excited indeed. In the meantime, please consider supporting this channel. All the details are in the description. That's what makes trips like this possible, and I can't wait to bring all of the details from my National Archives expedition to you folks. That's coming to you in a very special live stream in a little over 24 hours, so get ready for that as well. And until next time, stay angry about space.